Yes, folks, it's time for Australia and New Zealand to aggressively pull back from communist China. The writing is on the wall. They're not our friends. They are our enemy. We've allowed these communists to fund and influence our universities and buy up huge swaths of land. And we've even allowed them to take strategic assets like the port of Darwin. But it's not only the CCP we need to be concerned about. We also need to be concerned about communist Chinese immigrants who are infiltrating our countries. And we clearly saw an example of that during the early stages of the COVID-19 outbreak, when communist Chinese people sent tons of PPP and medical, and medical supplies back to their homeland. But finally, the penny is starting to drop, or at least in Australia it is. But first, and this is a bit embarrassing, turns out that we've got a new Nazi Germany on our doorstep, China this time. And here we are with our pants down. It's the Prime Minister himself who, in a speech today on national security, four times said that the situation we face now reminded him of the world in the 1930s, just before World War II. The 1930s has been something I have been revisiting on a very regular basis. The 1930s, of course, was when Hitler was building a fearsome new Nazi army for his dictatorship while the rest of the West just fiddled and hoped for peace in our time. Now, Morrison did not today say, hey, China's dictator is our Hitler. He was saying that the world order was breaking down now like it did then. We have not seen the conflation of global economic and strategic uncertainty now being experienced here in Australia, in our region, since the existential threat we faced when the global and regional order collapsed in the 1930s and 1940s. Tensions over territorial claims are rising across the Indo-Pacific region, as we have seen recently on the disputed border between India and China, and the South China Sea, and the East China Sea. Now, take each of those disputes Morrison just mentioned there. All involve China, and China as the aggressor. China's pushing so hard, for instance, against India's border in the Himalayas, where the troops have been fighting there with fists and clubs. In fact, just this month, 20 Indian soldiers were killed. It's also stolen the South China Sea and threatens aircraft from other countries trying to fly over it. Military airport. I'm warning you again. Leave immediately. All you will spare for is about the for all the consequences. And in the East China Sea, China has sent its navy into seas that are actually claimed by Japan. And then add the other tensions, particularly China cracking down on democracy protests in Hong Kong, warning Taiwan that it's going to take over that country too. We suddenly face a very dangerous world. The risk of miscalculation and even conflict is heightening. But here's the thing. Where are our subs? Where are they? You know, those... 12 new submarines that the Turnbull government ordered four years ago to replace our old ones. Those new submarines that won't even start getting built for another 14 years. With the last one not due to be finished until around 2053. Actually, I think it's four years, another four years that won't get built. Now, can our foreign minister please call China's dictator and ask him to wait 30 32, 35 years before pressing any buttons to just hold off using China's brand new navy until poor Australia finally catches up? I'll tell you what, how much more stupid does former Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull now look, having ordered these Adelaide built French design new subs from scratch four years ago on the spectacularly dangerous assumption that we could afford to wait four decades to get them all? Yeah, Turnbull was a complete idiot. But that's what do you get when you allow a progressive lefty to hijack your party. 
And to make matters worse, those subs are diesel. They are already obsolete. Well, it seems our new Prime Minister, bing, a light's just gone on. We've got to muscle up in a hell of a hurry. There's no other way to understand Scott Morrison's two big defence spendathons this week. First, he said he'd spend $1.3 billion to save us from more cyber attacks. This is just two weeks after China, which is the worst offender here, launched a cyber attack on Australia, a modern act of war. This activity is targeting Australian organisations across a range of sectors, including all levels of government, industry, political organisations, education, health, essential service providers and operators of other critical infrastructure. Now that's so brazen, you've got to ask what might China do next, to spy on us or to steal our secrets or to hurt our infrastructure, particularly in a crisis. Well, it seems Scott Morrison has thought about just that. Today he said he'd spend $270 billion over the next decade on everything from hypersonic strike missiles to underwater surveillance technology and smart sea mines. Well, did you hear that, folks? Morrison is going to spend $270 billion on upgrading Australia's military capabilities. And what is Comrade Adern doing? Ah, yes, that's right. She's talking about kindness. But most symbolic will be the new missiles he wants for our Super Hornet fighters. And these missiles, these new ones, will triple the range from 124 kilometres to 370. You see, we want to be able to hit stuff that's a long way from our shores, like Chinese stuff. Although Morrison put that more delicately. These new policies will require force structure and capability adjustments. These must be able to hold potential adversaries, forces and infrastructure at risk from greater distance. Now, we don't want China's Navy coming anywhere near our coast. It'd be a bit too late for us if it does. And it is China that was very much on Morrison's brain today with this announcement because there is indeed something very 1930s about all of this, particularly about the hyper-nationalism of Chinese President Xi Jinping. In May, Chinese state media reported Xi actually met a delegation from his army and told them to strengthen training and prepare for war. Now, I'm not saying that China is about to invade Poland or anywhere else, but most wars do start, as did World War I, with leaders making a miscalculation. They think, hmm, if I grab that territory or I bully that weakling, they're not going to fight back. It'll just be all glory, no pain. Except those countries do fight back. They feel they have to. And that could happen here. And you can, right now, you can almost see Beijing thinking, would the West really defend Taiwan? If we take it back, I mean, look how weak the West now is. It's weak in will. It's weak from the virus, it's divided, race rights, the West is in decline. And Xi Jinping now seems ready for some crazy risks. That's maybe why it's pushing so hard. Maybe it's because China's economy is slowing and he needs to give the Chinese people another reason to back him and not to shoot him. Yeah, and right now, folks, what is New Zealand doing to counter uh, this communist Chinese threat? Absolutely nothing. Adern is out to lunch, and sadly, the National Party is as well. But the most amazing story yet is actually over in New Zealand, although it has implications for Australia too, allies, security arrangements, etc. For nine years, Zhang Yang has been a member of Parliament for the Nationals. He's a man... This guy organised a trip to China by then Nationals leader Simon Bridges, who for some bizarre reason got to a public meeting with China's top spy chief and then went on Chinese TV to actually praise the Communist Party. Now, who got in his ear to do those stupid decisions? I don't know. Now, what makes Yang 
such a bizarre choice as a New Zealand MP is that before coming to New Zealand, this Chinese-born man for some 15 years worked for China's military and trained China's spies. Was a Communist Party member who taught spies English. Can you believe this? Yang says he quit the Communist Party when he moved to New Zealand. He's no spy. He's a you know, patriotic New Zealander. But ever since this story broke three years ago, he's dodged interviews, refuses them. So given the concern now about Chinese influence, including in New Zealand, Sky News' New Zealand correspondent, Jackson Williams, today went to ask this bloke for a chat. Well, Jackson Williams joined me a short while ago. Jackson Williams, thank you so much for joining me. Um, has Zhang Yang actually given interviews explaining his role as a teacher of Chinese spies for so long? Well, Andrew, the MP did a media conference in 2017 after revelations surfaced about his past, about uh, his connections to uh, military intelligence institutions uh, in China, where he admitted to uh, teaching uh, Chinese spies, but he is always denied being a spy in himself. But ever since those details uh, emerged, uh, that those revelations surfaced three years ago now, he has proved to be uh, an incredibly elusive figure for journalists in this country, at least for uh, journalists uh, representing uh, English language-based uh, outlets in the country. In fact, earlier this year, when Dr Yang's reselection as a national candidate was announced, it was done so. It was confirmed in a Chinese language statement since... Yeah, and republished in Chinese newspapers. So we have nzmao.com. And I'll just translate that. Ah, Dr. Yang's column. Dr. Yang Jian represents the National Party in the 2020 general election. The New Zealand National Party Council has officially nominated Chinese MP Dr. Yang Jian as a non-regional non candidate for the National Party's 2020 general election. Since then, the MP has only risen through the party's ranks following a leadership change about a month ago, moving up on the party's list from 33 to 27. The leader of the National Party, Todd Muller, has described Dr Yang as a hard worker who serves the Auckland community well. Well, that's all very well, but I would have thought people, particularly with all the emphasis now on what China's, uh, the interference of China in Western democracies, uh, he needs to make himself a bit more available than that. What happens when you ask him today for an interview? Well, I'm not sure if I'd quite call it an interview. I approached <laughs> Dr Yang as he uh, was uh, entering or about to enter the National Party's uh, caucus meeting. This is an, uh, a weekly event that takes place uh, in Parliament uh, during sitting weeks. Media uh, are allowed to be there uh, at the invitation uh, of the party in the corridors uh, leading to the room where MPs gather for uh, caucus meetings. Uh, Dr Yang was one of the last MPs to arrive this morning. I. Uh, asked him uh, whether uh, he would like to have a bit of uh, a chat because, as I mentioned, he has proven to be uh, incredibly elusive over uh, the past few years. Dr Young, will you be able to have a chat about your suitability to be an MP? Because some New Zealanders I'm have concerns. I'm suitable. Why, why, won't you have a, why, do you, why do you refuse to engage with English language media? Oh, I've been talking to English media. Why can't, we, why can't we have an interview now? Why can't we have a chat? Jackson, to me it's... The guy's background, whatever he says about, you know, he's a loyal New Zealander now and that was all back then, compromises him, particularly in his relations, you know, in his dealings, it must, with uh, Chinese figures in, in New Zealand who might be worried about what links he may or may not still have. How is this man still 
a Nationals MP. How, how did that happen? Well, that is a question that is being asked right now and has been asked for, uh, for a considerable period by uh, many people, including uh, some within this building, inside uh, the Beehive, the New Zealand uh, parliamentary uh, building. Uh, there have been some international media reports that uh, some Five Eyes countries, of course, New Zealand belonging to the Five Eyes Intelligence uh, Sharing Group, that some Five Eyes countries uh, believe that New Zealand uh, is compromised by, by by having uh, an MP with uh, connections, uh, his, his historical uh, connections to China's uh, military intelligence uh, apparatus uh, within New Zealand's parliament. Today I asked the Justice Minister Andrew Little if any Five Eyes counterparts have raised concerns about Dr Yang given his connections to China's military intelligence apparatus. The Minister says he doesn't talk publicly uh, about anything Five Eyes partners have raised with him, uh, specifically uh, in relation to national security, security matters. That said, the Minister uh, believes that members of the New Zealand community will be able to make up their own minds about the role that uh, Dr Yang does play in New Zealand politics. One individual in New Zealand politics who uh, has been much more forthright is the Deputy Prime Minister uh, Winston Peters, who has not held back in criticising the National Party for having uh, Dr Yang uh, represent them. Well, I must understand that four National Party leaders refuse to address this issue. Just astonished. Is it too late for them to address the issue? And what's, and what's the issue in your view? No, they could start standing up for this country. Ha! They could uh, start standing up for this country, he says. Now, that's rich coming from a, the guy who got Comrade Adern elected. Anyway, let's uh, find out a bit more about this guy, Yang. Hello, Jian Yang. So you're following me? Um, yes, we've been trying to talk to you for three days. Sorry, I have no comment. We've been trying to talk to you for three days. We need to talk to you about your links with Chinese military intelligence. Joining me in the studio now is Dr. Jian Yang. Is Dr. Jian Yang a... Dr. Jian Yang. 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 Okay, all right, Mr. Speaker. This is Dr. Jen Yang, the National Party's only Chinese Member of Parliament. Jen Yang's high profile in Auckland's Chinese community means he's an important part of National's campaign team. He brings in votes and money. But in this story we ask, who is the real Jen Yang? Why has our SIS taken an interest in him? And why does his military intelligence background in China not seem to appear on any of his official CVs. The Chinese community in New Zealand Security questions around Jen Young first arose when he was studying at Australia National University in Canberra in the mid to late 90s, before he moved to New Zealand. Young became a National Party MP in 2011 after being personally shoulder-tapped by National Party President Peter Goodfellow and was wooed directly by former Prime Minister John Key. Yeah, John Key, another Malcolm Turnbull turncoat. I thank the board directors of the National Party for their trust. In particular, I thank our President Peter Goodfellow. I cannot overstate Peter's help in the past few months. I also thank my party colleagues for their warm welcome and support. And I thank the Prime Minister for his trust and guidance. In 2012, Newsroom understands Young's connection with Chinese military intelligence first drew him to the attention of the SIS. It's highly likely that PM at the time, John Key, would have been notified at this point. Jen Young grew up in communist China and in 1978, it's likely that he joined the People's Liberation Army. The PLA is the world's largest standing army. Young went to the PLA's Air Force Engineering College, an elite military training institution. He taught at the same college for five years after graduating. Peter Mattis worked for American Security Services and is an expert in Chinese intelligence. His time at the at the Air Force Engineering College means that he was a PLA officer 
or one of the civilian employees of the PLA, but most likely an officer and almost certainly a Chinese Communist Party member. But what Yang did next is perhaps even more significant. He attended the PLA University of Foreign Languages, based in Luoyang, in China's Henan province. This institution is dedicated to foreign language skills and is part of what's called the Third Department of the People's Liberation Army, one of China's two military intelligence agencies. It teaches 29 languages, and its graduates include more than 100 PLA generals. The focus was on learning a language to a sort of a functional proficiency where you could speak, listen, transcribe, translate. And what does the third department do? What, what's its job? Well, the third department was responsible for all forms of signals intelligence. So that could be direction finding for signals. It could be encryption um, on the security side. It could be trying to break the codes and communications of other countries and other militaries. And in the modern world, that has meant computer network exploitation, breaking into network, computer networks abroad and stealing secrets that way. Yeah. Now, folks, I've posted, a, I posted a link to the rest of that video in the description below. Now, that video is really disturbing. But what is even more disturbing is this. How can a communist guy like Yang be anywhere near a political party in New Zealand? Well, the answer is simple. It's called multiculturalism and Marxist political correctness. <laughs> 